Make no mistake, Joe Biden ain't walking through that door. I'm J.O. I am the author of Maximize Your Medicare 2019 edition is available. You can check it out on the website there at the top of your screen, MaximizeYourMedicare.com. Sign up for the newsletter. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen to it on Apple Podcasts, anywhere that you digest your podcast. Anyway, the two... I've thought to take you through this newsletter, which is going to be released. Oh, well, this the date's wrong here. I'm going to change it to the 10th, and it's going to be released in a couple of hours, maybe even before noon Eastern time. This is the cover of the 2020 edition. It's going to be published by Sky Horse Publishing, out expected sometime in the February 2020 time frame. It has been sent to the editor at this point. First, let me say, I don't have a horse in this race, right? My horse in the race is to make sure that the people that you understand exactly what you are choosing, what you are, what the different proposals to reform healthcare and health insurance markets, which are two separate topics. They're related, but they are still separate topics, health insurance, healthcare, we have lots of complaints fired at all from every different angle. Of course, insurance companies being the culprit, I am a certified financial planner, which means I also represent health insurance companies on for clients, for all clients on a nationwide basis. That is true, okay? Nevertheless, the book, the newsletter, this video, for example, is not really for okay, I need to pick Medicare Advantage or I need to pick that prescription drug plan or this Medigap plan. You can see other videos on my perspectives and information about it. In one common thing is you'll never hear me mention a company or a plan right? as a recommendation. Can't do that without knowing something very, very specific about you, something we do for people on a nationwide basis. Let's step back here to the debate. So if Joe Biden called me and I wanted to distinguish myself and amongst this crowd, I'm the leader, right? I'm probably the leader. I'm probably the favorite. That's not to say I don't have issues. I do. One of the issues is circling the wagons after this whole, you know, once this debate season and the selection process, the risk they run, the risk the opposition party runs, of course, is that they could be fragmented and splintered in something that's going to be a very divisive election. I don't think that I'm being heroic in you know, predicting this. I think that should be fairly obvious. But if Joe Biden called me, here's what I would tell him. I'd tell him the first thing, and there are going to be a number of points I'm going to go through it because here written on paper, it is the shortcoming of the newsletter, which is that you know, you see it on text without the actual full flushed out explanation. And so, and the interesting thing here is that all that these, these can be done piecemeal, right? Because as you know, in the political process, the le legislative process, there's horse trading, left, right, and center, little cuts, little nicks, crannies it is the issue with the Affordable Care Act that you know, the three pieces had to all hang together at the same time, otherwise the entire thing would have collapsed. These are slightly different. So let's go, let's just get started. The first one I would do is I would make health insurance premiums tax deductible to individuals. So part of the reason that employer provided coverage or coverage gets offered Right, is the fact that the employer gets the tax deduction for their contribution. Okay. Individuals, we don't. Okay. We don't get to sign up on the marketplace, healthcare.gov, and get a tax deduction for our premiums. If you did this, then very simply put, you would have more enrollees who would be because then you would also have better control of the risk. And it's a common thread that I make in the book and on the newsletter, on my videos, et cetera, et cetera, which is I'm trying to 
explain some of the rationale to the Affordable Care Act as originally, and people say to me, okay, well, do I need insurance? Why do I need insurance? It's, it's also that the sellers want a bigger pool and not necessarily for bigger profits per se, that is certainly part of it. But, but a large part of it is that a larger pool means more controlled risk, okay? One that would do it is have more applicants. That's why we need all the 27 year olds in there. We need tw the tw every 27 year old paying a dollar a month for all I care. We need them in there. One way to encourage that is to have tax premium, that insurance premium tax deductible. You can see here that said this may help appease the ARP. And while I've been sharply critical, sharply and openly critical of the way that the ARP is compared against against the point, and this has got a typo, you can see it's in draft form. There is political and demographic reality, which is the ARP is out there saying no age tax. Okay, so it's beyond the scope of today, but no age tax is one of the most misleading slogans I could possibly ever create. Right? It's wrong. It's wrong academically. First of all, it's wrong academically. And number two is the ARP is distorting the message. Right? They're twisting. They're twisting the study, for example, written by real experts, and using it as evidence. That's not what the evidence said on this study at all. Not at all. In fact, I wrote to the statistical, you know, it's one of these think tanks, one of these specialist groups, they're out there running the statistical studies. I wrote to them saying, look, do you understand your, meth your conclusions of your study are being pulled out of context and being twisted into no age tax as evidence when that's not what the study said at all. All right, I, I got off the track. Anyway, so my point here though is that what we do need is we need more people enrolled in health, in health insurance. Why? Because then we can know what the losses are. And not only that, when you go to the doctor, when you go to the hospital, we need those, the doctors and hospitals to not have unpaid bills. We need them to not have unpaid bills, right? You own a 7-Eleven, and if you could shut down shoplifting, you would do it. Why? because there's an unknown factor there of how much money has been lost, right? Any commercial business had anything where you're counting dollars has this, right? Their cost, the, the electricity still got to be paid at your 7-Eleven, right? But you need to have fewer shoplifters. You need to have less spoiled goods, whatever it is. You need to have a lower amount of unknown costs. And for that, for doctors and hospitals, what that is, is patients who don't have financial resource or contracts, health insurance to pay, then it's a problem. Second, if Joe called me, or I should say, if Vice President Biden called me, sorry to disrespect the office, I would say medical school free, medical school free. And simply what you would do is like social service or civil service, right? Nothing has changed to the enrollment or the competitiveness of admission, nothing. If you became a medical doctor, you've got to serve on Medicare, Medicaid patients, right, as your primary practice for X years. After your X years is, is completed, you get to do as you wish. Right? If you want to be a plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills, fine. No medical debt. Now, you may think that this is like some crazy notion, but there are a couple of instances where this is actually occurring now. New York University. New York University now. In addition to that, in California, there's this a very similar type of template for doctors who are going to serve Medi-Cal which is Medicare Met or Medicaid, that is their name for Medicaid. So this exists. You could say that the medical schools are gonna be unhappy and you're in isolation, you're right. Now, if you wanna have big reform, somebody, everyone's gonna to have to pitch in a bit. 
and simply said, you call up University of Michigan, my alma mater, you call up University of Chicago, you call up John Hopkins, University of California, UCSF, and you tell them, okay, we'll stop sending you federal research dollars then. If you don't wanna play ball in having medical tuition at zero, you simply don't get any more federal research dollars. The, the university presence will uh, fall into line so quickly, this is not even, that's not even a debate. The reason you start with doctors, it's not here on this point. The reason you start with doctors is we need to not have this incentive, this notion of risk of we can't have a shortage of primary care physicians in the countryside. We have this now. Okay. You can put yourself in their shoes. It's not a good math of money vocational choice to be medical doctor on average. Right? Yes, you could say that they're gonna make it back when they're 50 years old. All right, that would be fair. That presumes they made it, which is not a layup, right? They don't give medical school degrees out of Cracker Jack boxes. And then in addition, they're still sitting there with this huge amount of debt, right? You're talking about a half a million dollars if you take my two schools. It's, a, it's the example I use frequently. You take my two schools, Michigan and Chicago, and you multiply by eight, and what do you get? You get half a million dollars. We're not talking about a place to sleep. We're not talking about books, food, beer, dates, none, none of that. Half a million dollars, okay? We need the maximum leverage, and that is the doctor. They're the ones who become the administrators of hospitals, they're the ones who frequently become, you know, health insurance executives to decide on, on whatever policies that are being offered and the choices that they make. Third, long-term care. So this is back to the original wheelhouse, which is Medicare. What Medicare covers, Medicare's excellent chassis, excellent chassis, we maximize your Medicare, it tells you that Medicare is a very good chassis. It is also an incomplete chassis, right? The rules are complicated. The hurdles are high, yes, yes. However, once you get beyond that, your choices are excellent, right? But there are limitations. And the glaring limitation here is there's no long-term care. Long-term care is the elephant in our society's room and we have no national strategy, none, zero. We have no national strategy. Medicaid cannot be the national strategy. We, you've got to spend down your asset level down to a few thousand dollars, and then every state has a different set of rules. They all have a different set of rules. What I would do here is I would propose a Medicare, a new Medicare part. So for people who are new to Medicare, what that is is <laughs> that health and prescriptions are handled on a separate basis. Okay, there's the health going to the doctor, and then there's prescription. Your prescription drug benefits is, is done separately, and that's called Medicare Part D. That's for your newcomers. For people who are on Medicare, you already understand this. I would introduce a new part. I would tell Vice President Biden, introduce Medicare Part L, and make it look like Medicare Part D, including the coverage gap. There's a reason for all of this, and it's more new, it's, I mean, literally, I could have like 10 videos on this particular topic alone, right? I'm not gonna bore you with it, but we need a strategy for long-term care, and we need it yesterday. Now, how do we get the sellers to play ball? And again, we're going, to need, we're going to need everyone, every stakeholder has to pick, pitch in here. I mean, you're going to ask for sacrifices from the stakeholders in order to have fundamental health care reform. Here it is. Health insurance companies, if you want to be offering Medicare Advantage, if you want to be offering Medicare Part D, you've got to offer Medicare Part L. 
So you can hear detractors of Medicare Part uh, Medicare Advantage specifically, and both, right? Big profits at health insurance companies. Yes and no. Profit margins small, right? So what isn't told to you, but you can see it in statistics, and health insurance companies share information with me privately because they're asking me how they're doing, what aspect of their plans are doing well in specific areas and why, okay, what is appealing. Um, you know, they share with me that Medicare Advantage margins are kind of proposed to be in the low single digits a year. Now, if you ask a corn farmer, you're gonna make three to 5% the next year out of your margins. Yeah, they, oh yeah, and by the way, you're gonna take all the risk also, including weather that you know, a lot of Midwest farmers are having a problem with this year, plus a trade war. Anyway, <clears throat> the fact is, is that the profit margins are narrow, okay? But we need to have this long-term care plan, if you will. Fourth, Medicaid goes to the carriers, all of it. Okay, so let's first start by saying the idea that you're going to end Medicaid is like lunacy. That is political suicide. Uh, the Republicans have learned this, right? As soon as you try to take away Medicaid, you are going to have, while well, you have an election problem, okay? That is not palatable. I don't even consider it as a possible path. And we can talk about different funding, block grant versus the status quo, et cetera, et cetera. The problem with Medicaid for everyday people, just to give you so you can understand, is Medicaid is a combination of state and federal funding. That's all well and good, except for all the states have all different rules. All. So let's say you lived in a house and you gave an allowance to your 50 children. The idea that they're all going to rationally or not try to pick off the system, et cetera, et cetera, or it's just too confusing, right? You can have 50 different, you basically have 50 different children applying the rules in 50 different ways. That, that presumes that everyone's like administering their own state programs consistently and that every individual that works for Medicaid in every one of the 50 states is also applying the rules correctly, okay? If you have any, had any experience in Medicaid, you will know firsthand, this is not pleasant. I need to be able to get a handle on the cost, however. That is a fact, okay? That's a fact. How do we do this? How do we do this practically? The idea here is we simply set it out to bid. We set it out to bid. We have bids for, you know, at, at, at your city hall, there's a bid, I promise you, there's a bid for maintaining the copy machines. There's a bid, there's a, re, there's a request for proposal, people send in proposals or companies send in proposals for this. And how you would do it is you have something that's called Dutch auction. You can see it there under four Dutch auction. And basically what happens is you basically tell the carriers, look, for three years, two to three years, something in that area, I think five is excessive, so two to three years, you say, I'm gonna allow two to three Medicaid carriers to administer the entire location. And the entire location could be, let's just call it two per state, two lo split the states, into not into 50 counties or every county, but broadly. Right? Maybe it's even statewide. Rhode Island, you only need one, sorry. One state, you need two carriers in the state. We need some selection. We need competition here. We need competition for the carriers to say, look, tell me how much it's gonna cost. Tell me it's how much this is going to cost. And basically, then you will let the calculators calculate, the insurance companies calculate. They say, it's gonna cost me X and it's gonna cost me Y. And we're gonna get all these bids 
and the two lowest get the single price. And that's a Dutch auction. So let's say someone says it's gonna cost me $5, and the other one says it costs you $6, and the three others tell you it's gonna cost me $15. Well, the two, the one who bid five, the one who bid six, they're both awarded at six. That's how Dutch auction works, okay? We need this because I need to lower the cost of Medicaid. Right? You can hear what a mess it is. People who are on Medicaid, you know someone who's been dealing with Medicaid, it's very difficult to administer, very difficult. Part of the reason, we have a big red number of governments. We have 50 different states administering rules in 50 different ways. Okay? We need some rationale here. Prescriptions. So the headlines are full, and it's easy to throw rocks at, you know, farm, uh, at pharmaceuticals, et cetera, et cetera. And it's easy because they're big, identifiable, they're high profile. And there has been wrongdoing. We have seen famous headlines about it. The simple, I, simplest, and there are lots of different proposals. Medicare says, okay, well, we want, to, we want to negotiate directly with the pharmaceuticals like the Veterans Administration has, does currently. They do do that, okay? The simple solution, the one that people can understand, is simply called most favored nations. And what this basically means is no side deals. No side deals to anyone. As soon as pharmaceutical A produces a drug, it goes at price number five, and it goes to price number five no matter where it goes, period. And the simple reason here is that there are way, way, way too many toll takers in, in the process from the time it leaves pharmaceutical A to the time it gets to the consumer, it has crossed who knows how many different Some of that has some rationale. Don't get me wrong. I, you're going to get pushback here. Of course you are. Because, for example, at a skilled nursing facility, at a nursing home, you cannot just have the orderly handing out the medication right out of the box. That, that just does not fly. Okay? There are, regula there are regulatory reasons for this, so you need to have it in packages, et cetera, et cetera, administration. We're not disputing all of that. Okay? Those, however, that is for someone else to figure in on a more transparent basis. The point is that the medication, once it leaves the, once it leaves the manufacturer, goes out at the same price to everyone, period. What you currently have, and lots of people don't know this, and, may, and maybe some of you understand this, maybe not. What you currently have is pharmaceutical A has a discount to pharmacy four. And let's call it 15%. Guess what? Next month, it, that discount is 25% at pharmacy seven. So basically what ends up happening is if you have an expensive medication, you're literally dialing for dollars. That's what's happening today. Why? Because the discounted at seven is better than last month's at pharmacy number four. That happens every month for medications. So once you get beyond generics, right? Generics, yes, we know that there, there are different pricing and we know that the price is higher on the sticker price for generics. That is in headlines that's beyond today. But the real one is that these discounts, these side deals from pharmacy, from the, from the manufacturer to the pharmacy swings around this violently. And if you're talking about a very expensive medication, specialty medication, this 10 to 15% is $100 a month. Now multiply by five for the very serious thing. Now it's $500 a month. Difference in pricing from pharmacy number four to pharmacy number seven. 
on each of these, or $100 on each of these drugs, meaning that you could literally have to dial for dollars. If you want to save money and you have multiple medications under these plans, that's your, that's actually what you're supposed to do. This is like nuts. I mean, my head is spinning even trying to explain it or trying to create the analogy to explain it. The idea of being a consumer under this is just crazy. If you've been a subscriber to the Maximizer Medicare newsletter, I've written about this in the past. I've written about this in the past. And what I basically pleaded is, let's get Amazon involved. Right? I mean, that's Amazon in a nutshell. Slice off the middlemen if they're not adding to the to the process, right? Slice out the toll takers. Get it to the consumer as accurately, efficiently as it possibly can muster. I didn't say perfectly, I didn't say profit free. Right? Nevertheless, consumer satisfied. Why? They got the best price, they had the most transparency. That's it. Right? That is Amazon in a nutshell. I think we can all agree. We can say, okay, we don't like Amazon for this, that, or the other, etc., and all that stuff. But the consumer, it works. The price is transparent and it's fast. We know what we're paying for. Right now, under prescriptions, we have no idea. Number six: Medicare optional buy-in at younger age. All right. So this kind of hits both the public option as and the public option as well as other proposals. So I'm not for Medicare for all because of the fact that, uh, first of all, Ben, you know, I think it's going to be too disruptive. Meaning. Up here, I put medical school free, number two. And there's a reason, is I need all the stakeholders to have some buy-in here. And the number one buy-in here, sorry, sits at with physicians. They're ones with the most operational leverage. And by operational leverage, what I mean is they have the interaction with the patients, they have the interaction with the decision-making, they have the decision made on the overall administration of healthcare. The single stakeholder that we cannot have objecting here is doctors. If I have to choose one, that's the one. They're the ones sitting in management at hospitals, for the most part. I mean, yes, sorry if you have a master's of public health or PhD in public health, and you know that's <clears throat> MBA in public health, for example. Yes, there, those of course. But ultimately, we need medical dom, medical professionals here at the decision making at the table. For me, Medicare for all is too disruptive. You're still talking about somebody minus three hundred thousand dollars in medical debt and telling them, "Okay, you're going to congratulations. We're going to cut your pay by ten to fifteen percent across the board." So they're not going to be happy. They still owe three hundred thousand dollars. They don't like it today, by the way. They're not in love with it today. And I can tell you this because, as I said on previous videos. You know, I grew up in medical hospital. I grew up the child of my father, a physician. And other than being told I didn't study hard enough, I heard, you know, stuff saying we're getting paid by Medicare and Medicaid and, you know, we are, it's not like it used to be. I've heard this story. That was decades ago. So it couldn't have gotten better between then and now. However, med Let's get back to here to Medicare optional buy-in at a younger age. This one, if you have to choose amongst imperfect solutions, this is probably the one that I would choose to advise. I would tell Joe Biden, Vice President Biden, this is probably what I want to do. And the question is what age, I've seen different proposals, 50 to 55. I probably choose 50 and there's no there's not a coincidence here the reason i chose 50 here is this is when people are eligible for the arp and in the political horse trading you could just hear you can see how complicated it is 
You can remember under point number one, you can see me criticizing the ARP sharply. Down here on number six, yeah, nevertheless, the fact of the matter, the practical reality is the ARP is you know, absolutely influential. Let's not kid ourselves. The ARP bulletin, the monthly bulletin, has the widest circulation of any monthly publication in the United States. That should tell you what you need to know. So allowing them to buy into Medicare will do multiple things. Okay. It will incent the persons who are 50 years old and above to go into Medicare. It will. People who are individually, who bought individual insurance can go to Medicare, which I can promise you from all of our clients nationwide, the moment they turn 65, they can't believe it. Their premiums plummet, their coverage you know, improves. The satisfaction numbers in public polls runs 85% plus on Medicare coverage. That you, know, you will not, not be able to find that in your high deductible plan with the $5,000 individual, dedu individual deductible and $10,000 out of pocket maximum. So this will have ripple, very important ripple effects. What does it mean? It means also that people, more people, let's just say you're 51, working at a large employer, you'll be able to get into Medicare. You can opt out. Okay, so beyond today, there's a bunch of details in here about whether or not those employers then can, should encourage them, et cetera, et cetera, and whether or not they will owe an extra tax, et cetera. Yeah, maybe that is, could be true, but the fact of the matter is, is that more people will be out of the employer market into individual Medicare. This is what em employers want. Why? They're trying to reduce cost. Simple. For small employers, this is a layup. It's a layup today. And the reality is, is point number six is really designed to point out something entirely consistent with Maximize Your Medicare, the book that I've written for, it's in its seventh edition this year, next year will be its eighth, right? Which is that <clears throat> I have known and have predicted, and by predicted, yeah, I have full command of the obvious, which is that health insurance premiums in the large employer market or in the employer-sponsored market, the individual market is inferior to Medicare by a lot. And simply people don't look at Medicare carefully enough, even when fully employed at 65 today. This mistake happens all the time. I promise you this is happening in your location today. I'm 100% certain, 100% that someone you know sits there with their employer sponsored plan in a far inferior financial situation with far inferior benefits but simply has said, okay, well, I'm on my employer plan period, that's it. Are there exceptions? Yeah. I've got a, I have a non-Medicare eligible spouse and six children. <clears throat> they don't need coverage. Yeah, for those persons, they stay on the employer provided plan. They stay on the employer. Now this is dominating our professional practice, by the way, right? I have a separate video, you can see it, working beyond 65 and all the enrollment issues. Okay. You'll wanna see that because there are a lot of, it, it's complicated, it's worth it. It's worth the examination. I'm not talking about $10 a month. I'm talking about thousands of dollars a year of lower cost plus superior coverage. If you expanded Medicare, to the lower age, what you would naturally have more people realizing this and lower enrollment numbers at the employers, which would help the employer, right? Which would help the employer. I'm not here into throwing rocks 
and, and calling out that a particular group is trying to rip me off. It's difficult. All the big stakeholders have real, real reasons. I don't presume that anybody is dumb here. Right? We just cannot do that. Why? Because they have got another sets of pressures that we do not know, or we can understand or imagine what they are, but they have their own other problems to deal with. Let's continue. Before I'm making this into like a six hour broadcast. <clears throat> Number seven. States can elect to re to create reinsurance pools and the CMS matches the amount. What in the world is this? So you can see what I've addressed. Right. <clears throat> Medicaid. So first what we what we tackle. We've t tackled doctors. We need them to have less debts. We need more for primary care physicians in small locations. We want doctors to live or to work at the rural hospital where they grew up. We need that. The way to do that is for them not to have $300,000 debt bill. We talked about Medicaid. We, we can't end it. There are people who legitimately need financial help. Get it. The problem is it's too fragmented. It's too, and there's a, and it costs me. We need to rationalize it. We don't have a long-term care solution. Now, what remains for the individual marketplace? Number seven addresses it. Okay. Which is, so reinsurance, and this is complicated and technical and all that stuff, but it's basically a backstop for the insurance companies. So insurance companies are calculating, right? They're calculating. They're calculating what the risk and the possible costs are. And guess what? The calculators can get it wrong. They can get it wrong. An earthquake can hit central Illinois. Yes, it can. And when it does, it's enough that you can literally have a disaster, right? Because Central Illinois, and I know nothing about Central Illinois, and don't ask me about tectonic plates and geography and, ge and geo, <clears throat> I guess it's geography in this instance, geoscience. I know nothing about earthquake, earthquake predicting. Except that if you, but in healthcare, this has outlier instances. And when they're big, you have problems. And you have this when the Affordable Care Act got you know, instated, which is certain carriers, they said, they recognized that, hey, we don't know what this risk set looks like. We can't get a handle on the numbers. You're asking for a bath. No, we don't like baths. We don't want to take a bath. We, we will exit. Right? And that's what happened. They exited. Others, and you can remember this a few years back, you know, ooh, we've got these new fancy new setups called co-ops. There's almost no co-op that still exists today, right? Why? They took a bath. So much so, they went bankrupt. Other carriers, they lost a lot of money. They were supposed to be compensated by something called reinsurance. And I've, and I've called it reinsurance. There are actually three separate programs, but way, way too deep in the weeds for today. <clears throat> Basically, what happens if insurance company, health insurance company lose money? Right? What happens if a health insurance company loses money? Well, they were supposed to have been compensated for something called reinsurance with under the Affordable Care Act, which is the subject of lawsuits because the CMS is currently trying to not pay for those losses. But reinsurance would work, but we need to have buy-in here, meaning that the states can create their own pool and then get CMS dollar for dollar matching, right? So you can see this in particular states, uh, Colorado. In Colorado, 
this is exactly what they've done, right? Which is they have instituted their own reinsurance pool, which would incent insurance companies to lower premiums, deductibles, out of co co-pays, out of pocket maximums. This should have been the way this works, right? But we do need to have it. And one way of increasing the size of the reinsurance pool is have the states allocate the money and then have a matching program by the CMS. And the CMS, for those who do not know, that is the federal agency. It's under the Health and Human Services. It is called Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This is the one that administers and regulates health insurance in the United States, the general of the Affordable Care Act. Insurance specifically is regulated by this on a state by state basis. <clears throat> it's a backstop. It's a backstop. You can read this here in the newsletter. The issue here is that every location is so different with respect to health care costs and incidents. Population density, these risks are different from location to location. For example, in sparsely located areas, uh, let's just say, or where it's inconsistent. Let's call it Iowa, famous story during the Affordable Care Act, right? Hemophilia costs $1 million a month. That's the sticker price. Now, I'm not solving, I'm not gonna sit here and debate why hemophilia treatments cost a million dollars a month. Then, again, that's not my debate here. My debate here is, okay, how, you have an insurance company with unlimited financial risk at this situation. You can never get back this $12 million. How are you going to get this back from other premium payers? Not possible. So they're going to face a loss. The question is, is that these different places, the hemophilia treatment, let's just say in another location costs $500 a month, right? Because the healthcare costs are that much lower, the premiums are that much lower. Not the other way around, by the way. But since the healthcare cost is that much lower, the premiums are much lower. Right? So in other words, if the risk of loss to the insurance company is lower, then the premiums are lower. Why? Because the health insurance company has a backstop. What's that backstop called? Reinsurance. Very deep in the weeds. There is a solution here. There is a thought on how and it's down here at the bottom. <clears throat> number eight. A twist to number seven is technology that currently exists. So first of all, when we go back to number seven, this is this plan is being enacted on state by state basis on isolated instances. It is also another way to deal with this is also on the back end, meaning that let's say the insurance that you have high deductible and your family deductible is ten thousand dollars okay this happens in the individual market that the family deductible six thousand seven thousand ten thousand that happens it is too high for most american households no question one big incident you will have a problem the great humanity healthcare foundation great humanity hf.org I'm the chairperson of it. I set it up exactly to fit in this spot because I command the obvious, right? Health insurance companies are dealing with some set of risk. That's what's setting the prices and all of these numbers, the deductible, co-insurance, out-of-pocket maximum, premium. You could, be a household, you could be a household doing everything right, meaning that you bought insurance because you understand its importance if something really goes wrong or you have pre-existing condition and you know that some that some event could occur. So nevertheless, you could be hit by this bill and that would turn your household upside down, affecting everyone. Well, Great Humanity Healthcare Foundation is to give financial assistance to insured persons so you don't have a free rider effect and yet create the financial relief for those persons. I digress again. Great humanity, hf.org. Anyway, 
Point number eight is more subtle, and but it exists and it exists quickly, which is we'll need Wall Street help on this one. So in the world, not lots of people know. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Everyday people know on this matter. People without investment banking or banking securities markets experience know that when you borrow money or when you have a credit card bill, that bill is frequent. The, the amount that you owe gets paid and then gets spliced by Wall Street to the largest investors in the world and by the billions, by the billions, okay? So uh, credit cards, what basically what happens is credit card, your credit card, your neighbor's credit card, the credit card holder in San Francisco, the one in Miami Beach, they all get pooled together, right? They all get pooled together and then they get spliced and diced and different sets of investors buy different risks. This doesn't, you would think in a similar way that this could happen to health insurance, that this could happen to health insurance. The difference between credit cards and health insurance is what I said about the Iowa instance, <clears throat> right? which is in the Iowa instance, one person with hemophilia costs $1 million. The loss is so big, right, that you can't make up for, for it. In credit cards, what happens is, first of all, you know, there's over collateralization and then, then senior, you know, senior and junior tranches, all that kind of stuff, more technical than for today. But the point is, is that the losses are known and are limited. So it allowed this packaging, this, you know, putting together of these different credit card holders. You can't do that in health insurance because why? The one case can make the entire thing fall apart unless the federal government is the backstop. And that's what I'm recommending. Right. In other words, if we could say we're going to have a limit to the losses of this set of gold plans, this set of silver plans, this set of bronze plans, whatever it would be, with the government taking the risk only if the losses exceed everything else, then it is possible to create the securities in the asset back market that could with health insurance contracts. How do you know this is gonna work? Well, you could say the insur insurance companies have unlimited computing and legal resource. Wall Street has unlimited legal and computing resources, right? The securities market will find the right price, guaranteed. Get to this, like certainty. People don't know how competitive it is. When you trade one, one hundred million, one hundred million dollars of U.S. Treasury notes, the the difference that between the bid and offer is not a percent; it's three hundredths of a percent. Three one hundredths of a percent. In other words, I'm very confident that if you had the CMS. If you had the federal government as the backstop to say the entire structure won't work out, what will end up happening is that the insurance companies in order to get into this market will then have the incentive to push down the premiums and improve the coverage in the health insurance contract because of the backstop that they know for sure will work as a result of this structure. So pretty complicated, Uncle Joe, Vice President Biden, if you want to be president. He's not walking through that door. Again, I've got to add the disclaimer. This is not Jay against, I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy, right? I'm not against the vice president. I don't have a horse in the Democratic you know, primary 
process, I am pretty sure that healthcare, health insurance markets are not leaving the headlines anytime soon. Be sure to subscribe to this station, to this channel, this station, this, this channel. I'll keep having these updates. I'll try to keep them so that people can understand. I know there's, there's, it's complicated, but it's important. And the reason health insurance, health care, I'm going to stop after this last point. Health insurance, health care are financial matters, but they are unlike any other financial topic. So I'm a certified financial planner, right? If you want to ask me about bond markets, I'll be able to tell you at crazy levels. I've worked on three continents, the largest institutional investor, government investors, okay? It'll look entirely different than what your local broker says. The fact of the matter is, <clears throat> the advice you're seeing here on YouTube, and you can just click around, you're here on YouTube, I recognize that. But if you go look for ed financial advice, let's just call it, I don't know, Roth IRA. Should I convert or not? Right, this is a frequently videoed topic. Can I video the word? I don't think so. Anyway, so this is a topic you can find everywhere. So tell me how many people benefit if you have some specific information about your Roth IRA, about whether to convert or not. How many people benefit? I can tell you how many. One. You. That's it. How... So you may say, well, we're both trying to buy that house and I want to be better off, so maybe I would not share this information with the next person because you're in a better financial situation. Fair enough. That is actually at the margin true. That is not the situation here. That is not the situation here. And the simple reason is a lot of the reason that you see the need for all of this stuff is that the parties can't tell how much money they're making or losing with any certainty. Be because your neighbor who doesn't know anything about health insurance, right, who has no idea the cost, they're bulletproof, they're health, they've been healthy for 55 years. They've been healthy every single day. Right? It seems like they've never been sick. They get sick without the right information in taking this risk. They're, of course, primarily taking the risk for themselves. And it's their business. It's, it's their business. That's fine. They're taking the risk for you. And why? See this thing here? Medical school free. You'll see it. Hospitals, Medicaid. They don't want these reforms because they're taking losses when people don't can't pay. It's not only the people who can pay, but there are people who cannot pay. Right? So in effect, that is that person taking the risk that has a follow feedback loop. <clears throat> the system lost money. They've got to re the bills have not been reduced. They've got to get the money back. Who do they get it back from? They get it back from you. The bottom line is that makes it very different advice here, very different information here than the information that I'm giving that you can see on YouTube about other financial topics, other economic topics. Right? This is not exactly the same as your Roth IRA decision. It is not your you know, delayed retirement credits decision. It is not. It is not your portfolio construction decision. Those are individual who only have one beneficiary, one recipient of, the, of that advice is you, the watcher, maybe your whatever, right? You don't have a reason. Well, it's none of your beeswax. But actually, the complication about health care and health insurance is the fact that your neighbor doesn't know has the ripple effect back to you. So please, share this information, get them to subscribe, go to the Facebook 
You can go to the Facebook page. Where, well, let me see if I can bring this up here real quick. I'm not sure how. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. I'll bring it up in just a second here. Oops. I'm not the greatest at this whole thing. Yeah. Yes, there we are. On Facebook here, this website, there is something called Maximize Your Medicare Community. It's here. It's free. You do have to, you do have to join the community, right? But in here, look, the number of headlines. I'm not going to have a 60-minute video on every single headline. There, there's a headline every hour, or there's a big headline every hour, I should say. But you can see it here other links to videos <clears throat> people who are part of this community people who are part of this channel are going to have special deals on the upcoming edition of maximize your medicare you can get it now be sure to go to the website maximizeyourmedicare.com subscribe to the youtube channel talk with you next time